I know. It wasn't my idea. Ant-Man and the last two movies, FYI, are re-watches. Uh, most, I like to do mostly first-time watches on these, what I watch live streams. But, you know, sometimes it's fun talking about uh, movies you've seen in the past and sharing them on these, what I watch live streams. And it's definitely the case with Ant-Man. Uh, the newest film, Ant-Man and the Wasp, Quantumania, just came out in theaters this weekend. There's a chance I'll be watching the film later on today after this live stream. And I can't wait to share my thoughts on that in next week's live stream, if that's the case. So the original Ant-Man, obviously part of the MCU, it was released in 2015, uh, the final film in Phase 2 of the MCU, and was the follow-up film after the release of Avengers Age of Ultron. This film was directed by Peyton Reed, and he has a pretty interesting little filmography. Let me look up some of the other movies he's been involved in besides the Ant-Man movies. Before he did Ant-Man, he mainly did small comedy films. Like he directed Yes Man, starring Jim Carrey. He also directed a film called Bring It On. He also directed, he even directed the uh, 1997 TV remake of The Love Bug, starring Bruce Campbell, which is kind of interesting. I know he directed one of the best episodes of The Mandalorian, which is the season two finale, which was one of the most epic uh, had one of the most epic scenes in anything Star Wars in the last few years with the Luke Skywalker appearance, which was epic. So uh, let me read the synopsis of Ant Man on Letterbox. Armed with the astonishing ability to shrink in scale but increase in strength, Master Thief Scott Lang must embrace his inner hero and help his mentor, Doctor Hank Pym, protect the secret behind his spectacular Ant Man suit from a new generation of towering threats. So, like I said, this movie came out in 2015. This film had a uh, some behind-the-scenes production issues because the film was originally supposed to be directed by Edgar Wright. Now, a lot of us film fans would love to have seen the Edgar Wright version of Ant-Man, and it was a film he had in development for many years I think it was in development as early back as the early days of the MCU when Iron Man was coming out. So Edgar Wright had been developing this film for quite a few years. And the film was getting close to being made. Uh, obviously, the actors were picked and the movie was about to start production. But I think as they were filming, Edgar Wright and Marvel Studios had creative differences over some of the story elements of the film. Uh, to the point where Edgar Wright decided to walk away from directing Ant-Man. And so Peyton Reed was brought in to replace him and finish the movie. Peyton Reed got full director credit, although Edgar Wright is still credited as a, a screenwriter on this film. And throughout, especially the first Ant-Man, you can definitely feel some Edgar Wright-isms uh, while watching the film. I think one of them, I, I wonder if Edgar Wright was the one who came up with the Michael Pena monologues. They feel like they come straight out of uh, like some of Edgar Wright's other movies like Scott Pilgrim vs. the World and the Cornetto Trilogy. Some of the quippy banter that Edgar Wright did so well in a lot of his other movies. But it would have been fascinating to see the full-fledged Edgar Wright version of Ant-Man. I don't know if it would have been better or not. But even in the, uh, I've had conversations, especially with my sister, who's a big MCU fan as well. And, but she strongly believes that him leaving Ant Man was actually all the best because she feels, uh, if he hadn't left Ant Man, he wouldn't have done Baby Driver. And Baby Driver, not only is it my favorite Edgar Wright film, but it's one of my favorite films that came out in the 2010s decade, which is an awesome movie. If you haven't seen it, one of my very favorites. So maybe it is all for the best. Uh, I don't know, but this is a movie when it was first announced, I had no idea what to make of this. Uh, the premise sounded so stupid on paper, like really Ant-Man. That just seems kind of bottom of the barrel to me, just on the idea of the character. 
and the trailers didn't really appeal to me that much. And I heard about behind the scenes issues. I'm like, this could be the first flop in the MCU. And I watched the film in theaters and the movie actually was pretty good. All things considered Uh, the movie. I don't think it's top tier in the MCU or anything, but I still have a blast watching this film and rewatching this film. Uh, The movie is very much small scale compared to anything else in the MCU. And I think that makes it all the more refreshing, especially that this was like the follow-up film after Avengers Age of Ultron, where this movie feels more like a heist film in a great end of the MCU in vain of like Ocean's Eleven or something like that. And I really enjoyed that genre twist in the MCU, and it was actually very refreshing. Uh, the fact that your main character is an ex-con who just was released from prison and is trying to set things right, especially with his daughter. And he gets recruited by Dr. Hank Pym to protect uh, his technology from going into the wrong hands and end up planning like the master heist uh, to do that. I like the fact that, you know, this is a superhero film, yes, but it's not really about saving the world. It's more about protecting the reputation of Hank Pym. And also uh, when his family gets caught in the crossfires of it, by the end, it's about saving his daughter, which I, I think made the film all the more personal. And I do like the heart that the movie was going for, where you have this very flawed guy who wants to set things right with his family and get a second chance at redemption. I do love the themes of Ant-Man because of that. And I think what also helps is you got Paul Rudd, who's such a likable, charismatic lead actor. And he does a good job of playing that character so well. Where you know, He does have all the Marvel quips and stuff, but he's such a likable actor. And he plays such a, he's so likable in the role, despite all the character's flaws, that you want to see him overcome his past demons and actually succeed and live a better life in the end. And I did really like that. Uh, I do love the shrinking technology in the film. The visual effects, I think, have held up pretty good in this movie uh, upon rewatch. And I, like I said, I enjoyed the cast in this movie. Uh, Paul Rudd, obviously, is good in the film. The mentor, Hank Pym. Uh, Michael Douglas does a good job of taking on that role. You got Evangeline Lilly as Hope, uh, his daughter, who... He's not in the not in this movie near as much. I feel like she gets her chance to shine more so in the sequel, Ant Man and the Wasp. But a pretty good introduction of the character. Uh, you also got s- some other supporting actors. You got Judy Greer, Bobby Cannavale, pretty solid in their roles. One of the scene seekers actually is Michael Pena, who uh, who assists uh, Scott Lang in some of his actions and is really hilarious. He's a h- very funny comic relief character. Uh, the mono- the comic monologues he gives in the film are comedy gold. And I enjoyed his character so much. I don't know if he's in the new film, Mania, but I hope he shows up at some capacity because I enjoy his comic energy in both of the uh, Ant-Man movies that uh, were previously released before Mania. I think if I had to have any real negatives with the film, you know, Marvel doesn't really have the best track record when it comes to villains, with the exception of maybe Thanos or Killmonger and, or other villains. Like they, they've gotten better in recent years on villains, but for the most part, some of the MCU villains are very, very one note. I'd say a good probably 60, 70% of their villains are very one note. And it's no exception in Ant Man, uh, the character. I uh, forget the character's name off the top of my head, but his suit is called the Yellow Jacket, and the character is played by Corey Stoll, who's a pretty uh, enjoyable actor. And part of the reason why I don't mind his villain, per se, is because Corey Stoll does a good job of kind of hamming up the character. So you got to give him that at least. He's invested into it. But the character is very one-note. And uh, as far as... And I, I do kind of agree with the criticism that The character's motives is very much identical to Jeff Bridges' character in the first Iron Man. It's like these characters are like copycats of each other, which is very weird. Where you have like this uh, very jealous employee that's jealous of the other guy's work and wants to steal the tech for himself and make a more sinister version of it. Kind of like Jeff Bridges in the first Iron Man. I think that trope was done better in the first Iron Man because one, that movie came out first, and two... 
Uh, Jeff Bridges is a much better actor, obviously. But uh, I think because you got Corey Stoll, who I think does a good job of hamming up the role, I don't mind the character. But it's definitely still a eh, villain in the MCU. That's probably like my only real gripe with Ant Man. Uh, the rest of the movie is very fun. Like I enjoyed the heist element is very good. Like the, especially the big heist where they break into the lab uh, is a pretty good heist. Some of the practice runs. There's a fun scene with uh, Scott Lang breaking into the Avengers facility to get something for the heist, and he runs into the Falcon. I thought that was a funny scene. The heist elements I thought worked. I enjoyed the story, especially with Scott Lang's journey is actually pretty good. The small scale was very refreshing for the MCU. Like I said, I like it. It's more about saving his daughter more so than saving the world, which I think made the stakes a lot more personal. And I appreciated that. Uh, had some great comedy in it. I don't know if the film would have been better if Edgar Wright had directed. Actually, I think it would have been better, but the version we got still pretty good. I think people need to give it more credit where credit is due. I think this is one of the more underrated films in the MCU. And I have a blast re-watching this movie. So I gave the first Stamp Man a four and a half out of five on Letterboxd. And on the 100 point scale, I gave it an 89 out of 100. So, and uh, let's move on to the last film from one Marvel movie to another. Hold on. You gave her wings and blasters. So I take it you didn't have that tech available for me. No, I did. From one Ant-Man film to the next, Ant-Man and the Wasp is the last movie I'll be talking about in this week's What I've Watched live stream. This film was released in 2018, three years after the release of the first Iron Man. This film came out in the middle of Phase 3 in the MCU. And much like the first Ant-Man, which was released after you know the big epic event film, this was the first MCU film released following Avengers Infinity War, which, yeah, that movie had some very earth-shattering conclusions in that movie, which shocked so many people. Yeah, I think Ant-Man and the Wasp was like a relief for many people after the big shocking conclusion of Infinity War. Uh, Peyton Reed once again directed Ant-Man and the Wasp, and let me read the synopsis according to Letterboxd. Just when his time under house arrest is about to end, Scott Lang once again puts his freedom at risk to help Hope Van Dyme and Dr. Hank Pym dive into the quantum realm and try to accomplish against time and any chance of success a very dangerous risk mission. So this film, uh, this film, not only was it, the, was it the first film released after Avengers Infinity War, but this is the first time we've seen the Ant-Man character since he was part of the ensemble Captain America Civil War, where he sided with Team Cap. And the film follows what happened to him after that, where because uh, Captain America's team kind of lost and the Sokovia Accords was signed, uh, Scott Lang was put under house arrest. And so we see like the aftermath of that in this movie and the fact that, you know, he can't really go anywhere, but he's down to like the last couple days of house arrest and he's recruited to go on another mission uh, with Hank Pym and his daughter, Hope. And so that kind of intensifies the stakes a little bit because it's putting his own, it's, it's putting his freedom again in jeopardy pretty much. And so there's a little bit of a, there's a little bit of stakes in this film once again that I do appreciate. And I, the, the film does have some good action in it. I think Peyton Reed, you get to see more of his stamp in a director's chair compared to in the first movie. Because in the first film, you know, you got him and you got a lot of Edgar Wrightisms. And you get to see more of what Peyton Reed can do as a director in this movie. And the action is pretty good. I forgot to mention with the first movie, I love the Thomas the Tank Engine sequence. That's still my favorite action scene and Ant-Man movie, but this film had a pretty fun car chase that made up a good chunk of the climax of the movie. And very comedic, but still has some good visuals in there, like the Hello Kitty Pez dispenser and giant Ant-Man trying to control a truck, which was pretty funny. So the film still has its charm in a lot of ways. Obviously, the cast helped 
make this movie work the way it is. Paul Rudd is still enjoyable as Scott Lang. I know people have complained. I've seen people complain that they dumbed down his character in this movie, but I don't really see that as he's under a lot more stress in the sequel, you know, because he's under house arrest and he's trying to, uh, you know, he's trying to get that solved, get through that. And, you know, he's being recruited and he's going out behind everyone's back and he has to try to fool the authorities once again that he hadn't left and stuff. So he's under a lot of pressure. And also, uh, because he hadn't been Ant-Man since Civil War, uh, his suit keeps malfunctioning. So it's not the fact they made Scott Lang an idiot. It's because he's under pressure and his suit keeps malfunctioning. So I guess that's something you got to consider when watching Ant-Man and the Wasp. Uh, and I think some of the malfunctioning suits kind of made the film fun to watch. And, you know, the banter between the characters is still pretty fun. Uh, this is definitely Evangeline Lilly's chance to shine. Uh, she was kind of a... I don't know if throwaway is the right term because you know, she wasn't the wasp in the first movie. They tease it at the end, uh, but we finally get to see her as the wasp and Ant-Man and the Wasp with that suit. And uh, some of the best action moments in the film revolve around her character. And I actually did enjoy uh, the additional element that she brought in this film. And again, the back and forth between her and Paul Rudd is actually really good. Uh, Michael Douglas is still enjoyable in the film. And yeah, Michelle Pfeiffer is added to the film as well as uh, Janet Van Dyme. And the, pretty much the big rescue mission in this movie is you know, she's been stranded in the quantum realm for a good 30 years or whatever. And she sent a signal in the quantum realm. And the big rescue mission in this film is to get her out of the quantum realm. And uh, that, that mission is a lot of fun. Uh, a little bit emotional and heartfelt because... It's a character that especially Michael Douglas and Vendling Lee's characters hadn't seen in many, many years. And I enjoyed, I think, some of the emotion that that brought, especially near the end. And I, it's cool seeing Michelle Pfeiffer being integrated in, into the MCU. And I'm excited to see uh, uh, where, the, it's, uh, where her character, what it's going to bring in, especially the Quantum Mania film, considering the character's past connections with the quantum realm. And that's like apparently the main focus that the story is going in the next film. I can't wait to see that. Uh, much like the first film, Ant-Man and the Wasp definitely has its villain problems. We got two villains in Ant-Man and the Wasp. Uh, you got the character Ghost, who is kind of like the main villain of the movie. Uh, she has these abilities to where she can't feel anything and she keeps glitching and stuff after like a lab failure. And her goal is to try to harness the abilities of the quantum realm to try to cure. Her. But in doing that, that's going to kill off Janet in the process. So she's kind of a, a sympathetic character, but she's also doing despicable things because she doesn't care if she kills an innocent character in the process. So it's kind of hard rooting for her even though you feel bad for her and you want to see her cured. Uh, and the, the character is very frustrating in a lot of ways because uh, it, it's weird that they're making this character the villain, but she's doing terrible things. But it doesn't. It, the character feels out of place in a movie like this, honestly. I think I wish there was a much more of a sinister threat uh, to make the third act more of an emotional payoff instead of doing this very sympathetic character that's very hard to root for because she's planning on doing something so terrible, which was a weird direction to go. And that that's a, definitely a big holdup that I have with Ant-Man and the Wasp. There's a secondary minor villain who's like this arms dealer character who's played by Walton Goggins. And Walton Goggins, you know, he's a fun little character actor. I enjoy. He tends to play villain roles. He's one. He was one of the standouts in The Hateful Eight. Definitely not near as compelling of a character or interesting of a character. Uh, it's fun seeing him in a Marvel movie, though, uh, doing that Southern drawl and playing such a hammy, slimy character, but very one note at the same time. And it's another Marvel movie where the villains aren't really that memorable. I also don't feel like this film is near as fresh as the first movie. Uh, it definitely, It's not near as memorable as the first movie. I still enjoy Ant-Man and the Wasp, but... I don't come back, excuse me, I don't come back to re-watching this film near as much as I do the original Ant-Man. 
which was a breath of fresh air in the MCU. This one I tend to watch if I'm doing like a Marvel marathon or something. And I watch all, all the Marvel movies, or in this case, rewatch the Ant Man films before I see Quantum Mania. This movie is really good though, but it definitely doesn't stand out compared to the first movie. It's definitely not near as inventive. A lot of times the uh, high sequence is a little bit more the same, uh, much like in the first movie. But it's still it's still a good watch though. I don't mind Ant Man and the Wasp. There's not too many things in the MCU I actively dislike. Uh, this film is just it, it's 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 a good one. It's a good one. I don't like it as much as the other ones, but I still I, I still like it for what it is. I do like. I think what makes it work are the uh, character interactions. I like Ant Man and the Wasp as characters. Uh, the action is very fun to watch. I like some of the uh, heartfelt moments that the movie does have to offer. Uh, the post credit scene, which ties into Infinity War, shocked me when I saw it in theaters, and it worked just as well when I saw it on rewatch. I hate that I don't have time to rewatch Infinity War Endgame before seeing Quantum Mania, but it is what it is. Uh, this is this is a good second chapter. I'm excited to see more of Ant Man in the third movie. I know it has mixed reviews at the moment uh some people really enjoy it and others were disappointed in it it's one of those movies where i have to watch it for myself to see where i fall on it but come on guys the movie can't be near as bad as the she hulk show am i right but we'll just have to wait and see uh for me i gave ant-man and the wasp i gave it a four out of five on letterboxd and a 77 out of 100 on the 100 point scale yeah villains are a lot more man than in the first movie not near as is the first but still good for what it is has some good action in it i enjoy the characters and i enjoy the overall charm that uh both of these ant man movies have so i enjoyed ant man and the wasp four out of five four and a half for the first one i uh, can't wait to see quantum mania